Welcome to the Lounge Lizards podcast. It's so good to have you here. It's a leisure and lifestyle podcast founded on our love of premium cigars, as well as whiskey, travel, food, work, and whatever else we feel like getting into. My name is Gizmo, and tonight I'm joined by Rooster, Senator, Pagoda, Grinder, and Bam Bam. And our plan is to smoke a cigar, drink some cognac, talk about life, and of course, have some laughs. So take this as your 66th official invitation to join us and become a card-carrying lounge lizard. Plan to meet us here once a week. We're going to smoke a Cuban cigar tonight, share our thoughts on it, and give you our formal lizard rating. We discuss recent EL releases. We do a deep dive on the history of Hennessy. We discuss proper cognac stemware, and we review yet another Habanos SA price increase, all among a variety of other things for the next 90 minutes. So sit back, get your favorite drink, light up a cigar, and enjoy as we pair Hennessy Cognac XO with the Monte Cristo Supremos Edición Limitada 2019. An Edición Limitada tonight on the pod from Monte Cristo out of Cuba. It's the Monte Cristo Supremos, and it's a Robusto, I guess a Robusto Extra, really, 55 ring gauge by five and an eighth inch cigar. And uh, I got to say, the wrapper isn't... It's very rustic. Yeah, it's not uh, It's not beautiful. It's not ugly. Yeah, it's not ugly. I mean, I, I, I think there are far more rustic like Cuban a ra- cigars than this. Yeah, like a rasp. Ras- it's got, it's got, a, it's got a nice hue, but yeah. there's these like... You know, blotches. I was, I was describing it as a, as a, as a redhead after a beach day. Oh, <laughs> it's just, it's still very beautiful, but there's just, you know, there's some, <laughs> some extra, extra color that came out in it in the sun. Blotchy complexion. Yeah, I'm very excited about this. This was sent to us by a lizard listener, the Mile High Cigar Guy out of uh, Denver. So we're so happy that uh, he sent these to us. We're very, very grateful. So thank you to him. Thank you, Denver. You um, are not a fan of this ring gauge, though, are you? I don't. You know, you know what's funny about you saying that is I was, you know, when I when these came in and they were 55, I just, I don't love a 55, man. I, like 54, 54 and up, I'm kind of out. But doesn't this length help your perception of this of this ring gauge? Because this is a, quite a nice cigar. It's it is the, a nice cigar. I'm not complaining. Yeah. But if, if I were to be blending or rolling or making decisions about this cigar, I would make this a 52, not a 55. But that's me just being you. a complainer. <laughs> I haven't had this size in a long time, so I'm kind of excited. Yeah. Let's cut this thing, it's boys. It's like an E2. But E2 is yeah. a 54, right? I don't think yeah. I've ever yeah. had it's an E2. Just a, oh, QD Small 54. difference. Yeah. We'll do an E2. We're going to do an E2 on the pod soon. I mean, the foot smells great. Yeah, the foot smells good. Honestly, I'm not getting anything on the nose, wrapper or foot. I'm getting some on the foot. And I got a tight draw, as I as I suspected. My draw is okay. My it's draw's uh, great. It's, it's kind of a Cuban little bit of resistance. Yeah, mine has some resistance, but not Mine's not awesome. so much that I think it's going to be a problem. It kind of has that Mag Forty Six level of yeah. resistance for me. Like it's just the cold draw is nice. The cold draw is very it's nice. It's delicious. Actually. Yeah, yeah. The cold draw is really flavorful. Yeah, wow. Mm. I'm curious if this is going to be a chocolate bomb, like a cocoa thing. Like I'm I'm really really excited about it. I'm getting a faint cocoa. Yeah, I am too. Yeah. Hmm. All right, boys, let's light this thing. The Monte Cristo Supremos. Again, it's an Edición Limitada from 2019 out of Cuba. It's going to take a while to light this guy. Yeah, it's going to be a minute. That's why I'm kind of going slow on talking about the cigar as we do it. Uh, it's a 55 ring gauge by five and an eighth inch cigar. So, you know, what's interesting about this, guys, this is the second Limitada we did on the pod. We're doing on the pod. The first one we did was the uh, Que Dorce Senadores, which is also from 2019. And, and that was shockingly good. Shockingly good. Fantastic. And I think it's also cool that the remaining 2019 Limitada that we have to do to complete the trifecta is the Ramon Ionis. Wow. Yeah, good on the light? Wow. Really? Okay, I haven't try. had it. Wow. First of all, this did not take nearly as long to light as I expected. Still toasting. And it is perfectly evenly lit, and the smoke output is just fantastic. So I dry box these, by the way. I wanted to. I, these were sitting at uh, fifty eight sixty RH for about two weeks, knowing we were going to do them. On oh the pot. man, rich, complex flavor. Oh this yeah, that's is, nice. This is awesome. Oh man, this is a strong Cuban. This is yeah. Uh, Holy You're shit. getting a little potpourri and fruit and cocoa all at once. Agreed. You know right? what? It, I hate to say it. Is that weird? Th- is it look, me? It's it's it it tastes like a 
it tastes like a fucking QD banged a Padron. Added just a little extra <laughs> soft, you know, color around the around the edges there. You're not wrong. There's a mustiness on the the tip of my tongue as as I a exhale little, the draw. That's barnyard. That I'm yeah, wearing. it's like it's like it's it's really really interesting. But it's a, there's a cocoa thing. There's an there's important a little, distinction. There's a little twang. It's a clean barnyard. Yeah, yeah. It's a clean barnyard. It's a clean barn. It's not yes. the Puba barnyard. Yeah, the Puba barnyard. <laughs> the kind Downwind. of barnyard that I can handle. A clean barn. This so is, um, this is surprisingly good. This is really interesting on the yeah, light. Yeah, on the light. Yeah, it has that. It does have, and we've talked about this with regionals and other things. You know, sometimes they put out cigars, and it's oh, it's a Monte Cristo, and it tastes nothing like a Monte Cristo. I think this is really in the wheelhouse of what I expect Guys, I, from Monte Cristo. I'm getting pepper know. like in the back of my. In the back of my palate, I'm getting some like some soft white pepper. Mm. Like I'm a not light getting white pepper. Any pepper, but that potpourri and fruit combo is weird and really interesting. I'll use a bam bam word. There is a little citrus here. There is a touch of citrus. Yeah, yeah maybe. Little cocoa, little citrus, coffee, well, maybe. One thing that's common, what everyone's picking up, this is a very complex cigar. Oh yeah. Which is why I'm really impressed on the light. No doubt. Um I also, to Grinder's point earlier. This is as New World esque a Cuban as I can remember in some time, in a very good way. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it, actually. Yeah, yeah. This is really interesting, Rooster. What do you Rooster, think on the light? Thinking? He's very quiet over I'm there. That's still, a good sign. Still trying to figure it out. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I'm, the aroma. Is, it's so not good. like it's like a calculus. It's not equation. like another Monty. I mean, I don't, I don't think it is either. I think it's it's a more complex money. I agree. Yeah, I with think that. it's in the. It's I think it's fuller, in the wheelhouse. It's like a fuller, bolder cigar. Like, and not you know, Cuban cigars are not in this wheelhouse. They're this is much fuller. Yeah, you know, at least in the beginning. We'll see how it uh, progresses. That's all true. Just but to go back to what Grinder said, I think he used it's kind of like a cutie banged a padrone. I think it's more like a Monty like meets a padrone. Yeah. Like I get some of the twang that you get in a Monty too. Like the Cuban notes are there, but then like this and and the Monty too has cocoa notes, but this like the cocoa is richer and deeper, like you would get out of a New World, um, but in a really good way. I mean, I, I love this so far. It's got that you know the, the the cigar that I would call out, you know, from a Padron that it's kind of like it's it's a perfect blend between like a Monty too, like you're saying, and the Padron 80th. Mm. How's your? I, th- I think those two because I wouldn't say it's like a family reserve or something like that. But. How's your um? How's your burn, guys? Pretty nice. It's, it's so okay. Far. Pretty good. It's yeah. still early. Early. Yeah. yeah. Mine's got a bit of a little uh, unevenness there. The beginning of the cigar is like that QD we had. The Senadores. Yeah. Yeah. But fuller. Yeah. This is, I think, a definitely a full full flavored cigar. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think when we had Rob Isle on the podcast, there was. I think he had said. Is there such thing as a full Cuban? This right now I on mean, the light, the jury's still out. But on the light, what you're saying, this is as close to a full Cuban cigar as I think we've had. I agree. Yeah. I think there also could be a risk if you smoke this a little too quickly; it could back up on you. I think you know what's funny when I was thinking about you know when I looked at these cigars, I'm like, man, is you know is this going to be a 45 minute smoke or something? I think if you push it to 45, I don't know if you're going to enjoy it as much. I don't know. You know, I, I think like you're saying, I think you need to... I think you need more than Really that. need to take your time with yeah. it. Yeah. Try to push it to an hour. Oh, yeah. If you smell the smoke that's coming off of the, the foot... Yeah, and the burn line smells amazing. It's delicious. Yeah, but it's, it's on, rich on the in the nose. nose. It's very rich. It's like you feel it, right? It almost makes you want to Unlike sneeze or something. any other cigar I've ever <laughs> had almost. Yeah. You know, Agreed. there's, a, there's a, a richness that we're trying to complement uh, tonight, this cigar, and that's the, oh, yeah. the cognac. Yeah, the Hennessy. You stole my line. <laughs> <laughs> I usually do that. <laughs> I, I did. You do usually. You yeah, do ben, usually ben do the, is the king of segments. T- it's a the bit se- early. That's my only critique. It's, my, it's a bit early. <laughs> I, you know, I'm going to note this on the ledger uh, for our please, please discussion it, after the pod tonight. The memo. It is a you do segue very very nicely. <laughs> um, so so we could back up, but I also no. You know what I do? I I do think here's the thing I will say in Grinder's defense with how full this cigar is coming in. I'm ready to put something else on, on my palate it. and try it. Yeah, and see how it pairs for sure. Let's go for it. So we got the Hennessy XO. And as we know uh, from the few times we've done cognac on the on the pod prior to this, uh, you have 
VS, VSOP, and XO are the good, better, best. That's right. And this is apparently the best that Hennessy has to offer at a well, reasonably reasonable price point. Of the standard point. production yes, stuff, yeah. Standard. They've got some crazy stuff. So let's try it, boys. That's insanely good. It's so good. It's so satisfying. God. Wow. What it's got amazing body. Well, wow, this is an excellent pairing tonight. I was saying it's so it 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 goes down like a like a heavy. You know how weight, weighted weighted br- blankets are like so mm-hmm. appealing. It's like a weighted bank blanket for my palate. Great analogy here. You know, it just feels it feels comforting and it feels rich and warm and full and like I kind of wish that there was like a fireplace here because the cigar right now the compl- the I I do I did want to compliment this this taste of the cigar early sorry but it's just it it's it marries each other so mm. so perfectly I, I think we all get excited when we have a really good pairing and sometimes these just work out this is, this is I think there out. are a number of episodes and really a handful where we've said the pairing is literally perfect oh, this I for me is perfect yeah. there is nothing I would rather be drinking with this cigar than what we have right now yeah it's a rich experience I think um. I think if we tried to drink this cognac with another Cuban cigar, any regular production really that I can think of, I don't know if it's going to pair as well as it is with the, the flavor we're getting off this cigar right It now. would likely maybe, overpower the yeah. cigar. Maybe yeah. the Partagas Maduro. Maduro number one. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Partagas Maduro. Yeah. That's Our very first point. The one that started it all. That was the first one. That's right. <laughs> and then Bam bought them all. Yeah. <laughs> and now we haven't, we haven't seen them in two years. Why are we, why are we going backwards? <laughs> Let's not go backwards. <laughs> The um the retro hail is definitely it's it's got it's got a bite, yeah. but it's it's smoother than I thought. I it's, haven't, it's got a smoothiness or smooth like silky. Haven't like done that creamy, yet. creamy. Yeah, cream. That's a good yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is really something. Definitely different. So you know, before we talk about, I know we want to talk about the Hennessy, uh, uh, brand and and their history and whatnot. But going back to the El thing, I think that. My understanding of ELs is people really love, generally love EL releases. Unlike regionals are kind of hit or miss. I think a lot of the regionals have done really well and have been successful. And I think that the Senadores that we had, the 2019, I thought that was very good. I mentioned before that there's one other 2019 that we should do to complete this trifecta, which is the Ramon. Uh, We have them. You guys have them. But... You said at, at the age that, you, that they are right now, they're not ready yet. Yeah, is that is I, that how you're feeling? That is, and it's actually really funny that you say that because I was in my tower today and um, I was trying to pick something I was really going to enjoy. And I actually opened up, I have two boxes of those, the Ramon 2019 Matata. I opened the box. I always look for it. Like when you see those little crystals we've talked about kind of on the wrapper, I know that cigar is ready and yeah. I'm looking at them. I'm shining them in the light and <laughs> I'm not seeing that yet. It, I feel like it hasn't matured enough yet. Um, now I will say they're still enjoyable. I mean, the last one of those I smoked when we were at my place out on my deck, the caviar night, um, I had lit one of those up with uh, some Paul Roger that we were drinking and it actually paired really well. But I want that cigar to develop more, a little richer in flavor. That champagne is maybe not an ideal pairing, and I would have a spirit with it. So I still think we should wait maybe another year. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you should put those in a Padron 80th box. <laughs> <laughs> so this cigar, when it came out, was 22 bucks, oh, And great. Great Rooster price. was looking at the price of this cigar either recently or today and it's what nearing a hundred unbelievable yeah 72 i think 72 but that was before the january price increase oh man wow right so you're probably at almost 80 85 bucks and that's when you're buying it direct from a retailer which there's not many of i I can't tell you the last time i saw any of these pop up and that beautiful you know it comes in a very beautiful deluxe no, you don't, yellow wooden, you don't see yeah, these. wooden box it's really nice. but, but what i don't understand is when these were released in 2019 2020 well, they, they were they announced out, i think in early 19 they released so in 2020 20 they came out and they were retailing for 22 dollars so that's only 2 years ago yep and we have had what how many price increases two three two or three so how do you go from 22 to 72 or 85? That's a Bono's logic, baby. Yeah, it is. Incredible. Elasticity. <laughs> I, I wish I could increase my prices for my customers <laughs> this, this <laughs> way. Jesus. I mean, it's, it, it's obscene. 
It's obscene. So um, let's talk about Hennessy because I'm fascinated about this. So this is the first time I've actually ever had Hennessy in my life. I've never had any Hennessy ever. Me too. I'm so, in the same camp. Really? You wow. haven't either. And I, that and surprises I, me. I'm excited about cognac. I've never had Hennessy. Grinder, have you had this before? Never. Wow. Wow. It's it new, sounds like a new stripper's, for all of us. stripper's name. Yeah, I, I've heard Hennessey. of this in rap songs and stuff. <laughs> That's the thing. I mean, honestly, the, the reason I haven't had Hennessy, it's just it became so popular and then such a big part of like popular culture that I'm, I'm sitting there saying there's no way this is truly a premium spirit. But when we were going to do this, I just wanted to do a little digging on the brand history and the story is tremendous. Like my level of respect for Hennessy as a brand exponentially changed after um, what I've read. And I, I'll just share a little bit. I think you guys will find interesting. So um, the part that we're familiar with and will not be shocking, Hennessy is the world's largest cognac producer. It's not even close. They sell about 70 million bottles of cognac a year. My wow. Oh gosh. And supply about half of the world's cognac. Wow. It's crazy. Is there any other, sorry to interrupt. I know that you're, you're in your first sentence. I'm already interrupting you. Wow. But, is there any other manufacturer of a spirit that has that level of, of command? How about of anything? Of anything. But of that level of command in, in, yeah, in the John, alcohol business. Johnny, Johnny well, Walker. That's the only one that comes to mind. Johnny Walker. Said Rooster. Yeah. What, was, what was the percentage again? Half. Over half, half of the world supply. So, but, but think about this. Cognac is not... It's not like beer, which is super fragmented, or not mm -hmm. super fragmented. It's ubiquitous. Beer is ubiquitous. It's yeah. not. It's it's it's. I don't think it's something that's drunk a lot. So if it, it's probably on the lower end of the categories across the globe uh, that people are drinking. So in those lower categories, those lower markets, the smaller market, it's easier for a few players to dominate a, a large percentage of the market. Mm. Sure, totally. And still, it's only still, made in one region, correct? Yeah, that's a exactly. Good point. Yeah. yeah. Still remarkable. But I mean, but but here's my oh, thing agreed. though. When I hear 150 million bottles is, let's say, what's sold in a year, as if a, from a cognac uh, standpoint, <laughs> that's a lot. That's a lot of alcohol. A lot of cognac being drunk. That's a lot of. That's a lot of cognac. Oh yeah. When you consider, you know, the price of this bottle is what? What would you pay for this grinder? Uh, two hundred. So this is two hundred bucks. I know what, that the so others are. Let me just say. Yeah. Two hundred was a price that I found nowhere else very like it's amazing we have a i'm very fortunate to have a very good liquor store near me that is owned by these amazing this amazing korean family and they have the best prices the best discounts and they do it on drizzly and it, it the difference between his price and the next one was 85 bucks wow wow that's insane wow so that's insane there you wow. go and it was that's and crazy. it was like it wasn't like there was it wasn't even close there was like three or four other uh, sellers and they were there just as high 40 like percent higher yeah. so the reason why I, I i just thought it was interesting like you think about 150 million bottles of cognac and, and this is a really small segment right mm -hmm. half of which he's sent you know a senator saying that hennessy is in command of you look at habanos that's a 500 million dollar business annually so it's like even cognac which is such a small percentage of the spirit market like dwarfs to, to your point far Habanos, yeah. to exactly what yeah. you just said i mean hennessy just as a business in revenue annually is almost a billion dollars a year so that's double habanos just yeah. in one cognac just yep. in cognac and that's, that's like crazy. we're saying it's a small segment of the like spirit market wow i'm sorry it's to have crazy. interrupted go ahead sorry um the, the last thing i was going to say uh even you know on on hennessy's dominance within that market there there are four big cognac houses there's Remy Martin. We've done, We've done three. three of their bo different bottles. They were all great. Uh, there's Hennessy, there's Corvassier, and there's Martel. So these, and these are huge. Most of them are owned by giant conglomerates. To have half of that out of one of those big four is it's still incredible. remarkable. It's insane. It's incredible. So a little bit more about their history. So Cognac, obviously, is in the Cognac region in France. And I just assumed that. Hennessy's history would start with a Frenchman, but it is not. It's actually an Irishman. Huh. Hennessy was founded by an Irish military officer, Richard Hennessy, in 1765, who served in the French army um, under Louis XV. Hennessy retired to the Cognac region and began distilling there and exploring brandies um, and then started exporting them first to the UK um, and his native Ireland and then also to the US. 
Hennessy named uh, a guy named uh, Jean Philo. I'm probably totally butchering the French pronunciation, so apologies already to our French uh, listeners, <laughs> as the house's master blender. And the crazy part of that story, the only reason I bring that up, I was shocked to learn that a member of the Philo family, who was the original master blender there, has been the master blender ever since, spanning eight generations and more than 250 years. Wow. It's absurd. It's a long time. 250 years you've had only one family exclusively master Incredible. blend. I was just I was just talking to my father about this concept that you don't really see companies last long. If you look at especially public companies, you, you you look at like the composite of the Dow and you look at just the life history of companies in the, in the United States and elsewhere. Companies don't last 100 years. That's There's right. not many. No. Yeah. Companies don't last 150 years. 200 years. I mean that's amazing. <laughs> the, the, that company, by the way, is older than the United States of America. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> let's just let's just be clear. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's awesome. It's exactly right. And the funny thing is, I mentioned you know most of us haven't had any of Hennessy's products before, and I just assume that Hennessy as a brand really became popular within the last several decades when it became big and sort of rap, and um, it was a, a big thing in nightclubs. You know, getting bottle service with Hennessy. But Hennessy became the world's leading exporter uh, in the 1840s. So wow. they've been the dominant market leader for so long. I mean, we're talking over a century. It's just crazy to me. <laughs> um, and then the other the last thing I'll say that's cool about their brand history is um, Hennessy very much set the industry standard on a number of things in the cognac space. And the biggest of them is the designations that we now use to define cognac, VS, VSOP, and XO. Um, Hennessy came up with those. Um, and the funny thing is, I mean, the names are so bizarre to me, like VS, very special, VSOP, yeah. very special, um, old pale, uh, XO extra old. Yeah. It, like, it, you know yeah. what it is? It's kind of hilarious because it's like, it, it, it almost feels like this Hennessy guy had some like, you know, Irish charm and wit that he's applying to this. Like, let's just call it very special. <laughs> I don't know if he well, coined it. The I don't funny think thing he... is, so I want to talk about that yeah. because I, I, I asked myself the exact same question. I said, did some guy just come up with these random terms? And VSOP was actually the first designation. And it was a British monarch who asked Richard Hennessy to make him a cognac that was very special old pale hmm. just came up with that term and so he said sure i'll make you a very special old pale cognac and he produced one and then from then then on they just started calling that level of aging and sort of how he made it a vsop and then they built in the other designations so so who's actually, the monarch in the 1840s that's that's got to be victoria right i would think so or husband you know it's what's also interesting is that's that was a period of time sorry it says uh King George the Fourth. George the Fourth. Mm, yeah. You didn't live very. I don't know if you lived very long. Anyway, the um, if you think about the timing of that, this is an Irish guy that be began hammering the markets of the UK and Ireland at a time when the British were exporting everything about their culture around the world. So he's just, you know, he's he's probably just cornered it and said, "I'm going to be part of this export across the world," based out of the, you know. They're 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 doing this all out of Liverpool and in the ports in in Ireland anyway. That's uh, it's amazing. It's it's probably just rode the wave. So I hope you guys feel the same way. Just after hearing all that, the way I view Hennessy is very different than kind of when I went into this. Yeah. Um, and the spirit we're drinking right now like speaks volumes. I you know I view Hennessy as just like mass marketed trash. I mean I never sure. took Hennessy very seriously. I can't speak to their other their VS. Say, or their what VSOP. would the VS? What would the VS taste like? Who you knows? Know? But this XO, outstanding. Agreed. Creamy, heavy. So XO is the highest amount of age of standard production. Yeah, they have special stuff that's right. aged way longer that sells at like five thousand a bottle. No exaggeration. So we're uh, about in three quarters of an inch inch into this cigar, boys. Um, I'm very satisfied. It's a slow smoke. It's a slow smoke. Oh yeah, it has mellowed off a bit. It, yes, I think right. a lot actually for yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, in it's a nice way. Out. It's not I'm, bad. I'm no. not getting that pepper that like punch. I was getting it right in the beginning. Yeah, which I was really enjoying that. I so, find this to be so. Very I wasn't satisfying. the only one that tasted some pepper. 
Yeah, there was yeah. A, there was a hint of pepper. Some white Not pepper. Not yeah, in, yeah, yeah, like a subtle. Yeah. Sorry, Giz. No, I mean I, I'm just I'm I'm very impressed with this cigar. I mean, even the smoke that like right now like it's hitting your nose it's not like it was in the beginning no it's not it's smoothed out honestly it, it, it's that clean barnyard description earlier is very accurate yeah i'm getting a lot of that it definitely smoothed out yeah it's like i also feel like and i just touched it up a little bit i feel like the wrapper is very thick on this thing mm. which is not typical of a cuban cigar so i touched mine up a lot me too. Uh, because of the the challenges I had with the burn, yeah. And I saw, you know how when you when you torch it for a little bit, the the pel- the little balls of oil accumulate. Yep, I, that was happening a lot on my cigar. It's it's, it's kind of oily. It's very. It's definitely oily. You know, it's, it's not a, a bad thing, which yeah. you don't see a lot in Cuban. No, you don't. You know. Do we yeah. know like how long these were aged before? So the well, I all I know is that these boxes were released in twenty. They've only it's only been one release mm. of these cigars. Uh so they were obviously purchased from that original run. And I've had them, you know, we we got them sent by a mile high cigar guy. Um I've had them maybe about a month and they've been in dry box for about two weeks, just well, anticipating the, that we were gonna the record. ELs usually they use aged tobaccos. Yeah, so I I, I looked this up. For this cigar, I can't speak with uh, to all ELs, uh, but supposedly, allegedly, right. uh, from knows? Habanos. Yeah, I mean, who knows they, with Habanos? They claim I mean, that this was two years aged before it roll? was boxed. Interesting. It's a, that that feels light though for for the flavor of this cigar. You know, mm. it's amazing. Yeah, it's only it's two Cuban years. tobacco. Yeah, though. and I'm also yeah exactly like I mean like you know you referenced the Rob Isla thing like you know. He he referenced uh, Hamlet, who said that you know, it's impossible to mess up rolling with Cuban tobacco. You know, it's like so easy to roll and and so easy to blend. Hamlet will figure out a way. Absolutely. Yeah, and usually a Cuban will mellow out over time, and it's still a pretty young cigar, so you're getting a good punch. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, I'll say this: I think we all experienced on the light. This was really new world esque. Yeah. As this has gone on, to me, it's not that like the flavor has fizzled out a ton or anything like that. It's just now it's kind of just retreated back to being yeah, a it's, Cuban. It's settled like in. It's 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 firmly a Cuban cigar. Yep. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing New World esque right now. It's matured this. back to what it was meant to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. I'm curious how you know the. I'm I'm curious how it's going to perform though as we get into the second third and last third. Obviously, that's the the real tell. I'm I'm curious. You know, uh, I'm curious how it's going to do because this has definitely got more oomph than I was expecting tonight out of the cigar. Senator's it's pretty far ahead of me. And I'm at about an inch. Yeah, you and I, I everyone else is at, at the same. Senator's a, a bit ahead. I am at the point, though, where I do Grinders wish that... way ahead. I, I do wish that the draw was a little more open at this point. You know, I don't yeah, like... Yeah, the I don't draw's mind it. a little tight. I feel like I'm having bit. to force it a I little bit. I, honestly, when I first lit this, I was worried about that. I kind of like it. I don't mind it at all. I, I do too. The only yeah. reason I say that, and I'm usually someone actually that doesn't like a snug draw, on this cigar, the flavor, especially initially, was so rich that it's forced me to slow down a little exactly. bit. Exactly. And to exactly. really appreciate all the flavor notes I was getting. Yeah. So I, it worked for me with this it's cigar. It's working nicely because the draw is a little slower. It's quite nice. This so, is a beautiful cigar. I love it. Look at the rooster's ash over there, huh? Yeah, it looks beautiful. Wow. I see you there. Shaking that ash. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've talked about this so many times, boys, but it's time to talk about it again. Our friends at uh, Habanos have decided to raise their prices again. Yeah, not good. Now what? <laughs> what happened now? How much are we going up by? Well, it went up in January. And uh, let me run you through what they uh, decided to do. So, uh, Bihike, Cohiba Bihike, the entire line went up 50%. That's it? Only. Um, so, t- let me just clarify for listeners again. This is an additional price increase. There was one in May and, uh, May and June of 22. This is another one six months later that was dropped on everybody about 15 to 30 days before it happened. So, Cohiba Bihike, 50% increase. Other Cohiba cigars... Between three percent and fifteen percent, Sigla Six was fifteen percent. So a, a twenty-five count box of Sigla Six right now from a reputable vendor is probably going to be about three grand. 
Trinidad went up another 3%, which that's actually a standout to me. We should talk about that. Yeah. Monte Cristo uh, Linea 1935, which that's one of the earliest. I think that's the first Monte Cristo we did on the pod. And I love that. It's phenomenal. Yeah, we loved it. Yeah. That, that line went up 5%. Romeo's Linea de Oro, their high end line went up 10%. Uh, the other global brands went up 10 High value brands went up 10 and the portfolio brands went up five. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I looked at RAS prices. You know, Ramon, I own especially selected. We smoke a lot of those. Those went up 14 and a half. When you say portfolio brands, are those the standard production? <clears throat> no. So um, I'll run you through that right now, actually, just so we're clear. So the value brands are Boulevard Punch, Ramon, and ah, okay. yeah. Trinidad, but we're excluding Trinidad uh, from this discussion because that was only 3%. Hardly a value right now. Yeah, well. Uh, but those went up. Um, 10%. Mm-hmm. And then the volume brands are Jose El Piedra, Quintero, and Vigueros. And then there's a bunch of other brands that have gone up somewhere between 5 and 10%. So, you know, I, I, I saw something on, uh, on the FOH forum where one of, the, one of the users there, one of the guys on there, asked a question. And this is one, something I wanted to pose to the group here. At what point does Habanos price you out? price us out of buying cigars because as we discussed and i'll start with my position on it i felt that the may june price increases we talked about with rob um in uh in in november Mm -hmm. i felt that that price increase was actually kind of in line with the kind of value i get out of most of the cigars excluding cohiba and trinidad you know, the Partagas D4, I think that's a 15 to $18 experience for me. And that's fine. I'm fine with that. RAS, same, et cetera. But if we're going to be increasing these prices 15% every six months, I mean, at what point, like, we're going to be buying $30 you know, D4s? We talked about this when we had Dan on. Yeah. And his comment was, I'm going to smoke less Cuban cigars. That's what he said. And it kind of makes sense. Keep your inventory. Build it as you find a deal. So, but, but, you know, I, I don't know how sophisticated they are. I think we've talked about this. They don't seem that sophisticated, but maybe, maybe they are. Because if they have the ability to, they have a lot of constraints right now. There's a lot of shit going on in Cuba. There's natural it's a, disasters. It's a bankrupt economy. Bankrupt economy. And people, you know, COVID was very disruptive, obviously, everywhere, but there especially. And they're short on workers, and we've heard the stories about inventory and this and that and the other thing. Maybe they're like, well, we can, with, with our capacity right now, with what we can do, we need to make margin. We need to make some, some, some margin on this, and we can do that through a price increase. And that might mean lower volume, yeah. but we'll at least maintain some kind of revenue. And it may push 25% of the consumers out, which mm-hmm. yeah. maybe they're okay with. And that's fine. Yeah. yeah, because all of Asia continues to buy at a very high pace, regardless I mean, of the all price. of the world. And I also, mean, guys, they have a they have an international brand that is they've got the you know the Warren Buffett moat around it. Like Cuban cigars are Cuban cigars, and it's a national <laughs> company. <laughs> like that's it, you know. And we're all smoking and loving Cuban cigars, and they have the ability to control the market like that. Yeah, and I don't think they're affected by the protect- bankrupt economy. They're independent of that. I think in many ways. They don't. Well, you guys were in Cuba not too long ago, right? I mean, you saw how many sticks are, are ready to be shipped, we, but they don't have the boxes yeah, or they don't have, right. the, yes. have the paper. So that's, that's part of true. the bankrupt, bankrupt economy. economy. Very good point. So they need money to do that. I mean, yeah. they need money to ship it, but the the factories had rollers. Oh, they sure. Were, Sure. Full capacity. Full capacity. Oh, yeah. so they, 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 need, they need to pay the rollers. And they, they need they to need... pay the rollers well. Yeah. Yeah. That's never going to happen. They need to treat them well, and, and it's, that's going to improve the consistency of the cigars sure. that are being rolled. And they need to keep making them because yeah. that's that's the that's the communist way, right? Uh, and that's the socialist economy. They have to keep they have to keep giving they them have money, to keep producing, yeah, and therefore working. Listen, I I I'm at the point though where a regular production robusto being let's say forty percent more than what you would pay for a padron or something else. Put a dollar amount on it. Let's say it's a thirty dollars D four. No, so no, I, this it's I, crazy. I have very strong thoughts here. Your question was, at what point do we stop yes. buying Cubans? And I have like a very hard metric in mind on this. 
for me, the Pargus D4 is like my favorite Cuban period. Just every day I, I can smoke a zillion of those. That's, our That's like the benchmark for me. Whatever the price of a D4 is, it's going to dictate kind of my Cuban consumption. If a D4 ever exceeds 25 US dollars, I'm out. You're out. That cigar, young, is not worth more than 25 bucks to me. It's just not. I agree. So I, I pray well, you're not there's far. never a day that they get that crazy. You're at 18 but bucks there, now, roughly. there's a hard limit. I'm not going to spend $30 on a D4 when I can spend half that for a Padron Exclusivo or countless other New World cigars that I'm going to have arguably as much of an enjoyable experience as that stick. Mm-hmm. It's just not worth it at that well, point. Well, yeah, yeah. you know, to your point, I mean, a D4 now is probably 20 21 bucks from a reputable retailer. You're probably going to be paying 5 to five fifteen for a box of 25 Now, think about... Think about when we were buying those cigars in 19. Dude. They were $215, $225 a box. It's more than double Doubled. what you were paying two, two and a half years you ago. You also have to think of what's rest of the world paying for a D4. Which, yeah. Like, well, we, we it's with the tax. Well, it, again, again, it's crazy. skewed, right? Crazy. Asia. Asia's yeah. driving all of this, right? No, but well, he's the, talking he's about tax. Talking about, yeah, he's talking, talking about tax. About, so yeah. Not the ah. source of the problem. Like, to exactly Rooster's point, I mean, just within the last few years, when I go to Europe, especially London, you go to a little newsstand that has like Tubo D4s, which is awesome. Like, how great is that? Imagine going to a newsstand here and it's like, oh, here's the Tubo. Here's the D4. That'd be great. But you walk up there and I'm not kidding. I've had to pay like 30 something US dollars just for a little D4. That was a few years ago. And that's a few years ago. Now oh, it's probably in the 40s. Like, yeah. you know, that is madness. That's yeah, horrible. And, and it's like, you know, Senator mentioned this several times in the past, and it's making me think about it more and more. It's just, to me, it's eliminating potential entrance into uh, yeah. enjoying Cuban cigars. Sure. You know, we've I, talked about that. Yeah. I wonder um, what percentage of their cigars smoked per annum or distributed actually end up back in the United States. It's a good question. Because because they might have it. Uh, a public view of like, well, like 90% of ours is going to Europe or whatever that number, 50, 40, whatever it is outside of the United States. But those, those companies are located in those countries and they can rightly say that that's who we sold it to and that it's finding its way back. And well, like, that's how we get our cigars, a, right? A yeah. few years back, I read a number of about nine to 10 million cigars come to the U.S. per year, which is probably much higher during COVID, yeah. you know, or yeah, after since COVID, since yeah. COVID hit. So yeah. what's the number of cigars that are produced out of Cuba yearly? Any idea? I'm assuming it's somewhere 60, around... 70 million? No, oh. I'm, no, I'm sure... I'm assuming it's somewhere around 15 million. Yeah. 15. So think about so, that. No, I, it's probably closer more. to 20. It's probably closer to 20 million, I would think. At, if, they're, or if they're grossing 500 million bucks... Yeah. You know, what's the average price of a cigar, even with the craziness? I mean, I'm assuming it's between 15 and 20 million. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, again, even still a very compelling argument that most of their market is in the United States. And we have a lot more other substitutes. I don't think that's true. Why? Because that he, number that he's talking about is not Cuban cigars, it's all cigars. No, uh, not Cuban cigars. Cuban cigars. That's You're what saying he there's said. 10 million Cuban cigars coming in every year? Yeah. That's, that's what I've about. heard. So that's what I'm saying. I think I think Cuba produces more than 15 to 20 million per year. Well, let's go back to Iligito. What were they doing per month? Do you I remember? think Iligito produces around 2 million cigars a year. Yeah, I thought well, a, mil- Corona a produces, million and a half for Iligito yeah. is what I thought. Co- Corona produces about 8 million, and that's the biggest by far. Yeah. So, so, so for, the, for the year? For the year. I think you're looking closer to 15 million a year. That's what I'm saying. It's 15, 20 million, I think, is the number. No, I, I am really loving this cigar. Yeah, it's, it's really mellowed good. out nicely. It's really good. Yeah. I, to, you know, it is smoking slowly. Oh, I mean, we're probably about thirty-five minutes in. I should have, and been, yeah. I feel like I'm at halfway, yeah, or yeah. even You're even really, a little. You guys are all ahead of me, actually, which is unusual. I'm going very slow on this guy. I'm enjoying it. I'm getting a beautiful barnyard, a, still a tiny bit of potpourri and fruit, just a faint hint of that. But the barnyard, I'm loving. Yeah, it's really good. Very nice. I'm very happy. Oh yeah. We we've talked a lot about Monte Cristo as a brand, and I think we reviewed the um the nineteen thirty five Maltus. Yeah, the Linea Maltus, yeah. And I think all of us smoked that cigar and said, Wow, this is much better than we would have anticipated. Because I think the only Monty that we regularly smoke is like a Monty two, maybe a Monty four. Mm-hmm. That's pretty much it. 
I, I smoke some Monty ones. Okay, that's right. Edmundo I have at home. Yeah. Um, but among the brands, I mean, we smoke definitely more Rass, obviously more Partagas, more Upman. So Monty probably falls at like the back half of what we smoke. But when we had that stick, we said some of the higher end Montys, there's a lot of merit to them. Like the consistency issues that we have with Monty 2s, that cigar we smoked, that uh, Maltus, we were really impressed. Yeah. This is a Limitada from Monty. So far, I think everybody's enjoying this cigar. So I just, for me, this is bi- further building the case that these higher end Montys are actually really solid cigars that Absolutely. don't disappoint. So the one thing I want to say, though, I want, I, want to, I want to go back on our feelings on Monte Cristo what over you know almost a year and some some odd months ago when we did that episode that was really early on you know at that time we were smoking boxes from probably 17 18 19 to money twos and yep. we, we were having some issues let me tell you something in 2022 i smoked a lot of monte cristo number twos and they were all good i didn't have a single issue right with monte cristo number two all good for I, me, I for have, me as well so all i'm gonna say is that i think that there's been a significant improvement through covid in in what Monte Cristo is is producing, and I you know I remember saying on that episode it's a sin that it costs this much money at the time whatever that linea nineteen thirty five was it, why does it cost this much money to get a high quality of experience out of a Monte Cristo, and I feel like since that time I've actually had really good experiences with eighteen dollar Monte twos in particular the eighteen and nineteens are smoking great and my twenties are great. Mm. I mean, also to what you just said there, I mean, what a damn shame. You said this cigar started out retailing at 20-something bucks a stick. Yeah, This is worth every dollar at that price point. I wish I had this back then. I would have bought a box of these, no question. Yeah. I would buy a box of these today at $35. Yep. I wouldn't spend I would, 80. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I 100% agree. To your Monte Cristo comment, I had, a, I had two or three boxes of those, and they were gone so fast. The Monte mm-hmm. Twos? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from 20? Yep. Oh, man, they were there. That was that was a great year. They yep. and they're. I think they're still on a heater. As, I've had a couple twenty ones. Late twenty ones. As Rob said, it's yeah, a, I mean, it's a run. Yeah. It, yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Monte Cristo's on a good run. And I mean, when when Bam and I were at La Corona, I mean that that's obviously the the home factory for uh, Monte Cristo cigars. I got some Monte twos when I was there. Man, they're fantastic. I had a young one there. Yeah, fantastic. fantastic. So, you know, unfortunately, like we're saying, I mean, this, this $75, $80 cigar now that we're smoking. Um, it's untouchable. It's, well, and we're not going to want to pursue it. Yeah, it's unfortunate it. that yeah, we're very, not going to buy these and have no. these regularly, but it's it's because it's a great cigar. It is. I mean, the ash on this is structural. Look at that. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, you got a really nice burn line. Yeah, and it's fantastic. I touched it up twice. Mm. Yeah. Very slightly. It has mellowed off quite a bit, though. Yeah, but it's still. I think it's got an. It's, it's got tasty, bo- but it's and it still has body and it's tasty. Yeah, yeah. I have to say this on it mellowing out. So, at some point, I was chatting about something, and I just kind of left left the cigar by the side, and I wasn't really drawing for a while. And when I just let it sit and cool, mm. and then took a draw, I got this blast of flavor similar to kind of where this started. In a way that when I was just regularly drawing on this cigar, it was starting to fizzle out a little bit, like you're talking about, Rooster. So I just wonder if this is one of those cigars that you just really like need extreme patience mm-hmm. with, yeah. and it's worth the result because I think we love how this thing started out. Yeah, yeah let's start all over. <laughs> <laughs> we need we need five more cigars. Uh-huh. <laughs> I mean this this is such a gift. Thank you. It really so is. much. Yeah. yeah, like what a what a. What a wonderful experience. It's a treat. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's a full-on lizard, man, and uh, very kind of him to send these. He just said, hey, can I send you some cigars? I said, sure, you didn't tell me what they were. Very generous. And they showed up, and he actually sent five others that he asked us to wait on because they're just not ready yet. Ah. Um, May we ask what they are? Uh, they're pretty awesome, but we'll talk about that. I don't want to <laughs> tease. We'll, I'll tell you guys after, but we'll probably do those later in the year. What, awesome. an, what an amazing experience, like having... You know, friends around yeah. the world that can send us cigars yeah, to taste. That's awesome. Amazing. The lizard reach knows no bounds. So I got a good question for you guys because this is interesting to me. So uh, Valentine's Day is coming up next week. And when I think about Valentine's Day for me, it's not a cigar time. Uh, like I'm never able to get cigar time in it. So I'm always focused on the bride. 
do you guys have that same experience or do you cut away and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to ask Bruce. No, I was going to say, can I, <laughs> can I tee up one lizard? <laughs> the lizard that we all aspire to, to no, be like, on Valentine's Day. Honey, hold on. I'm smoking a cigar. <laughs> because there's a great story here. One, one of my favorite cigar lounges in Manhattan on Valentine's Day, oh, I think yeah. it was last year, Rooster sends me a text. Why don't, why don't you tell the story, Rooster? Yeah, this was uh, the Merchants Club. I mean, you guys have all been there. So we happened to be in the city, and it was Valentine's Day. We were walking around. Uh, I think it was Bryant Park we were walking around. So I'm like, honey, it's early. It's like about 3, 4 o'clock. It's a little early for dinner. We don't eat dinner this early. So I said, you know what? There's a spot. Where, and merchants and let's go over there we're gonna we can have a cigar and she was like mm, i don't know it's valentine I'm like ah, i will have a good time i, I, so, <laughs> I wasn't so asking i was telling <laughs> <laughs> we end up there and they had just opened up after covid it was literally like the first night they had just opened up and uh, i'd never been there and we ended up there, and uh, we actually ended up eating dinner there and had two cigars. That's great. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's great. That's, as they say, that is uh, some dick game. It was, oh, it was a great uh, Valentine's Day. That's a yeah. dick game. It sounds you, like it. Can you imagine? I, I've loved this place. This was a legendary cigar lounge in Manhattan that closed down, was closed for maybe four or five years, and then all of a sudden, in the middle of COVID, just reopened in a different location. And I've been, I was dying to go back to this place. And Rooster, who hadn't been there, on Valentine's Day, sends me a photo and a text saying, I'm at Merchants, and I'm saying, how are you possibly there on Valentine's Day? You know why? Because every day is Valentine's Day, too. Oh, here we go. <laughs> oh, here we go. You get a lot of credit, is what you're saying. You, you'd have a great career in marketing. <laughs> <laughs> you should come work with Pooba. <laughs> I don't have that same experience on Valentine's Day. I, I, my wife is, uh, uh, you know, we, we we try to go to dinner if we can, but usually we're kind of inclined to say, let's pick another day and make exactly. that our own. Go a week before yeah. or a week after. Exactly. And and uh, you know, and she she's not she's not super amped about the Valentine's Day thing. I get her flowers and a card just because I love her and that's you know, I don't want her to feel Yeah, it's a fucking Hallmark holiday. Yeah. You know <laughs> it's, uh, it's a cigar holiday. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Yeah, celebrate like a week before a week early. Same thing with Mother's Day, Father's Day. Don't well, go on that day. Why? I don't know. That's Why? A little, that's it's a little a, extreme. Yeah, that's a little yeah. that's it. I don't know about that. Because <laughs> any restaurant you go to, they have limited menu. Uh, the service usually sucks. So why not like go a couple of days? I agree on Valentine's Day, but I don't know that I would go as far as Mother's Day and some of the other holidays. Yeah, I'm not going to tell my mom like, my 76 year old mother like hey we're gonna do mother's hey, day mom, every day is mother's day <laughs> we're gonna do mother's day a week after i don't know if she'd go for that no if you're having it at home that's different but going out to eat and stuff i think it's kind of i think it's the, overrated the, the thing even with valentine's day like you're saying all these holidays the restaurants get crowded the service suffers the quality of food suffers the whole experience suffers but the thing that i have the hardest time with valentine's day compared to those other holidays it's even the people in the yeah, restaurant. Yeah. Like Mother's Day, you know, if you're going out to a brunch somewhere or dinner or whatever the case may be, it's like everyone's there to celebrate their mother and it just the intentions are really nice. And I, I haven't encountered really obnoxious guests in a restaurant on a day like that. It's the best. They're so warm. It's wonderful. But you go on Valentine's Day and, you know, all of us are sitting here. We're married. Like, okay, it's one thing we go out to dinner. You have like couples that are on like their first few dates and one's clearly unhappy you're like looking around the room and some of these people <laughs> are on their phone the whole like just the scene for me is just awful yeah like are, i don't want right. to be around i mean you're 100 right. right yeah, yeah. I, gotta, I gotta take my mom to merchants next month. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how that goes. we're gonna send a camera crew and do a, i'm gonna, gonna come video. celebrate your mom <laughs> yeah. <on Mother's> Day. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> so let's uh let's let's do a contrast on uh uh, Rooster's Dick Game. Our friend over here, as you guys may have seen on the group chat, oh. has a new addition to the family. Right. Uh, oh, yes. well, tell us about that, Rooster. Oh, we got a kitten. <laughs> 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 I remember you saying we were sitting on your deck and you disputed this. Yeah, and now that I think about it, I think I'm I'm more of a dog guy. Um, you know, I like I like dogs. Cats are so easy though. That is true. The ca is cats, true, you don't right? have to let them out. Like they do their own thing. They Kind of want to be around you, kind of don't. You well, know? you know what? When I when uh, Jill and I got married, she had a cat, and she had it for eighteen years. Wow. So I kind of got like the 
the last few years of the cat's life. And she was, you know, it was she was a senior cat. So with this one, like I mean, she's a kitten. She's so playful. It's awesome. She's adorable. She just runs around here and there, you know, does does things that I haven't really seen that, right? So I'm really enjoying her. It's Beautiful awesome. Kitten, yeah. So did you rescue her? Yeah, you picked yeah, her up at a, a shelter? Or? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's great. Awesome. That's great. It's already, uh, you know, I had all the shots. It was spayed and all that. Awesome. And, uh, Keep the um, raccoons away. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> how, how are the cat's raccoon killer uh, instincts? You got to train that you cat. You train that cat. Yeah. Right now she's eyeing the squirrels and the birds. Nice. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Like my dog. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, my dog loves the squirrels and the birds, mm-hmm. and he loves to sit on top of couches and drink milk. He's like a cat. Milk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you guys, a couple of you guys have cats. You don't let wow. them out, right? I mean, they're not outdoor yeah. cats. When I when I was growing up, I grew up in Pennsylvania, and uh, the cats that we had were outdoor cats because my parents had five acres, and the cats just loved to be outside. You know, you'd bring them in when it was cold, or you'd bring them mm-hmm. in at night. But the first thing in the morning, they want to get outside and, and stay I mean, just roam out. They yeah. loved it. They How many it. dead birds did they bring in the a house? Lot. A lot. There were a lot of gifts. <laughs> oh, yeah. And they, yeah. they truly treat them as gifts. It's yeah, so it's funny. The gifts. <laughs> My mother-in-law had this very similar room. setup with uh, grew up with cats. They were outdoor cats. And as a gift, they kill a bird. And one day, my mother-in-law told me this story. She walks in her bedroom as a child and on her pillow is oh a dead God. bird that the cat brought as a gift right on the bed. And she's like, you got to be kidding me. That's awesome. I love I, that. It's, I, it's amazing. I think I want a cat now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll be honest. I love cats, man. I, I always have. I'm a big dog guy, too. You know, Bam and I were in Cuba. Oh, dude. And uh, Cats everywhere. And it's so sad because they're just, you know, Cuban people are having they're difficulty feeding themselves they're and their starving. children. Yeah. Nevertheless, feeding well, you know, cat. stray cats. I'll tell you a funny story. COVID was actually very good for cats in countries where there are tons of strays. Mm. When I was in Greece uh, recently on a vacation, uh, there's cats all over the place, roaming everywhere. And, you know, we have a cat. So, of course, like every day, my wife, like we have to first go get like tuna and all this stuff. We're like feeding like nations of cats. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it's ridiculous. He is the senator. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny thing is I'm the talking to a friend it. of mine who actually lived in Greece for a few months and uh, he was telling me, he's like, the funniest thing, all of a sudden in Greece, you would walk down the streets in the middle of COVID when the pandemic was bad, and there were suddenly not that many strays. It's like, where did they all go? Apparently, the lockdown was so intense in Greece that the only way you can leave your house after like five o'clock is if you had to walk a pet. So everyone just went out and adopted a cat, <laughs> and then they said they had to walk the cat. Walk the cat. And that's how they were. That's so amazing. all these cats found homes because of oh, COVID. It was fantastic. actually amazing. Did they put the cats on leashes? I I assume. Yeah. I love that. That's amazing. It's also, you know, (laughs) it's fucked up. (laughs) But I I love that. You know, Bam and I, so uh, when we were in Cuba, we we would go uh, and have breakfast at this place right near our our casa. And uh, it was a great place to have breakfast. They they had the best bread. The eggs were great. And the eggs were great too. That it was phenomenal. But there was this cat that was always hanging around a few of the tables. And we were watching. There was another guy. I think it was a European guy. Remember this? The guy was sitting there by himself. Was, and he put his jacket and his bag down. The cat was like almost in the bag. The cat, the cat <laughs> had gotten to the point in just this guy eating his breakfast that it had declared ownership not only of, of him but also of his belongings and had made a full-on bed <laughs> in his coat and his bag. It was that were, It was very adorable. Yeah, yeah. That, that's how they get you, and that's how you end up adopting that's a cat. That's how you have a cat, yeah. We, we walked into a cat cafe, which is apparently a thing. That's a big yeah. thing. Oh, boy. They have this in a bunch of cities. We were living in D.C. at the time, and uh, we like had this, this uh, like crate, little carrier for a cat. We were going to adopt one, and the cat that we were planning to adopt, without any prompt, and we just walk in, like the carrier's down, we're just discussing the adoption, all of a sudden, he just roams straight in the carrier. He's like, I'm going with you guys. And that was it. We took a boat. That's amazing. I love that. <laughs> uh-huh. And so you've how, got... How do, how do you... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, how sorry. do you... Like, how has a cat become an indoor cat versus an outdoor cat? Because I want an outdoor cat. This sounds awesome. Like, the gifts and, like, him going, him or her well, going you, hunting, I, and that's you kind of cool. have to be careful, like where we live, because here of all is the, different. All the fox, you know, there's yeah. foxes around, coyotes oh, and yeah. stuff. Oh, we have we also, have a, it's like if you live by a busy street, it's like they can get hit by yeah. cars. So where, where, yeah. where we grew up, grinder, it was different because the animal population out there, there's not really foxes and 
coyotes and stuff where we grew up. So we never had an issue with cats getting picked off. But where we live in North Jersey, you know, there's some pretty rural, you know, uh, areas of North Jersey here. And I know several families that have lost five, six cats because the cats get out. And that's the end of it. Yeah. Uh, even, even puppies. Puppies. Even small yeah. dogs. I mean, oh, of course. It's really, yeah, it's, it's difficult here. But I mean, really, it, if the cat has claws, which declawing a cat is pretty, uh, yeah, pretty frowned upon yeah. now. But um, if the cat has claws, of course, I mean, they'll do all right. Oh yeah, they'll do right outside. I, Their instincts kick in. I learned that the hard way. <laughs> I'm declawing. <laughs> oh really? So oh, random story. So we're we're signed, we're filling out all the paperwork to adopt our cat, and one of the questions on there. Now, mind you, I've never had a cat before. Uh, the one we have now. One of the questions on there is, do you plan to declaw the cat? And they're very militant about this whole thing, which is good. Like they want to do like a home visit, all this crazy oh, yeah, stuff. I'm like, my it. God, like there's so many cats that need to homes. Just give them to people that are willing to adopt them. But anyway, it's it's better that way. So one of the questions, do you plan to declaw the cat? Now I'm reading this. I'm like, we've got nice furniture. I don't want the cat scratches. Of course I'm going to have the cat declawed. So I just check the box. Yes. <laughs> and I, for some reason that night, I like send the paperwork off. And for some reason, I just, that question. So I'm like, why would they care? We're going to declaw the cat. So I Google Google. This. Oh, yeah. And the first thing I see is like, no rescue will allow you to adopt a cat if you plan to declaw them. It's inhumane. And then I'm reading what they actually do. I assumed it's just like they like pull out the claws or it's like, pretty they serious. They basically like cut a, half their fingers, oh, like for a no. human finger, like oh, off. Yeah. It's horrible. So I'm reading this. I'm like, oh, shit, we're not going to get this cat. So I email back and I just say to the person, I'm like, I just realized, um, you know, I mischecked that box. Of course, we're not going to declaw the cat. And the, the person responds like, we figured it was hopefully a mistake. <laughs> and luckily, we have our cat now. But I learned the hard way. Your yeah, cat's a not... legend, by the way. Well, his cat, yeah. well, his cat has an actor's name. Yes. Walter. 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 <laughs> Why, whoa, whoa. What? Yeah. Yeah. Walter <laughs> drives trucks. He <laughs> gathers like, firewood. What commercial, what commercial was that? <laughs> I think it's Chevy. It Chevy. Is. That's right. Chevy. <laughs> Walter the cat. So my, my cat for the listener looks similar to Walter the cat that's in the Chevy like pickup commercials. That's a stage name. And especially why they're similar is even their demeanor. The reason I, n not being a cat person, um, it was very easy to to adopt our cat. He's extremely dog like. He's a dog. He yeah. is. Yeah. Like he will sit on command. He will high five. He is the life of the party. We could have fifty people in our house. He wants to meet every <laughs> single person. Yep. Most cats would like run under the bed. If you had 50 people making a ton of noise, they'd be terrified. It's the complete opposite. My cat hates my wife. <laughs> what? Lives in the house. If my wife, like I could do whatever I want to the cat. I could pick it up, pet her, love her. If my wife walks in the room, the cat's gone. Does your dog get along with the cat? Uh, the well, the dog gets along with the cat. The cat does not get along with the dog. Oh boy, <laughs> are there wars? Uh, no, not wars. Okay. The cat just kind of, kind of bats him a few times. Now we know, him. we know Walter has his own bedroom. <laughs> yes. Will your cat get its own bedroom? No, my rooster? cat does not have its own bedroom. Rooster? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. If not yet. Says. No. Yeah. Th this, just for the record, this is out of necessity. <laughs> oh. Oh. Okay. So no, very seriously. So I mean, when I mentioned I have a dog-like cat, like he's so active. Like too honestly, he was surrendered. We asked the shelter why he was surrendered, and they said because he was too active. And the problem is, like he he loves to play, and at night, what we discovered the hard way is if we just left him out, which is what most cats do, they just sleep freely wherever they want in the house at night. We tried this, and he would run into our bed. He'd start batting our head. He wanted to play in the middle of the night. We're like, we're mm -hmm. trying to sleep. Yeah. So then we close the door. We're like, okay, easy solution. Just close the bedroom door. He will hurl his body against the door. <laughs> At the door? Throughout the whole night. You're well, just hearing boom, boom. Don't forget when we were sitting on Senator's deck that night. <laughs> oh, he was that we were all there. He was jumping off on the, the couch into the glass. <laughs> after you. He just yeah. wanted to be I near think he was after you. Right. You know what's funny? We've been talking about your your cat for a long time, and I've never heard this story. And oh. I'm loving this. <laughs> So the funny thing is, like, this keeps happening, and we can't sleep. Like, we're sitting there like, oh, my God. Like, we love this cat. We don't want to give him back, but we can't sleep. He just will not <laughs> sleep. So we're Googling how to possibly how deal to with this. make a cat sleep? Pretty much. And thank God some forum, this genius person, said, if you just put the cat overnight in a confined space, a room by itself, it'll just knock out the whole night, and you won't have that problem. So... Uh, what we did is now in our house, he ridiculously has a bedroom <laughs> and he literally goes in there at night. We give him like a little night snack and he'll just, we close the door. 
he just knocks out all eight hours, nine hours, and then he's up in the morning. But if we let him out, like sometimes I remember my wife and I, we'd have a little too much to drink at dinner. We would just, oh, we'll just leave him out tonight. It won't be so bad. And Torture. we had the worst nights of sleep of our lives. So it's out of necessity. You should I try cognac. <laughs> <laughs> just put a little, put a little oh, yeah. Hennessy in the bowl instead of milk at night. That's me. right. Yeah. Have you heard of a thing called Zoomies? Oh, oh yeah, yes. it's real. That's <laughs> real. Oh yeah. yeah, they just start going crazy. Cats and dogs. Oh yeah. my, yeah. my dogs, dog. Dogs yeah. too. Those, dogs, dogs, those too. doodle combos are famous for and, and really any dog. What they'll do at the end of the night is they'll kind of just want to burn off their energy. Yep. Mm. Yeah. And you'll, we, we they'll just it, wake up and just go bonkers. We yeah. call it the witching hour. Yeah. <laughs> so we have two witching hours in our house, <laughs> and oddly enough, my daughter and my dog are on the same fucking schedule <laughs> for, for for the zoomies for zoomies for chaos for everything. For, for naps so like there's never like a balance where like we can have oh one is napping and then one is is on it's just full of octane they're both at it at the same time <laughs> because like he he hears her wake up and he's like oh let me play and he wants to like be with her and he wants to be with me and he wants to be with the baby and i'm with the baby and it's just like a it's it's a it's amazing it's a it's wonderful awesome. yeah. cycle but it's also chaotic <laughs> There's, I love I love pets, man. Yeah, actually, Bam joy. Bam was making fun of me in Cuba because I I would see dogs and cats and poor things. I just kept saying poor oh, things, poor things. <laughs> oh god, poor yeah, it's poor true. Dogs. It bums me out. Yeah, you know? I want to take them all home. Like if, if so, you didn't care about the people, but more about the really? dogs and cats. <laughs> <Jesus>. Really, <laughs> really. Oh boy, poor. Things. I was gonna say it as well, but he beat me to the punch. <laughs> Uh, we were we tried to be as generous as we could. Absolutely, you, brought, you guys brought a lot of gifts. Yeah, we, yeah, we oh, did yeah. a lot of good yeah. stuff. Yeah, I mean that's yeah, that was amazing. That's of you. nice. That fun. So, boys, we're coming into the last third here of the Monte Cristo Supremos. What do you think of it? I'm enjoying it. There's two factors that I, I, I the draw is definitely. I wish it wasn't as packed as it is. Really? I, I wish I had my draw was a little bit better. Mm. Um, I don't know if the saliva. You know, on the on the head of the cigar is you've got down pretty far though. I'm getting there. I'm really, but to answer your question, given all that, I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, I think the flavor is fantastic. Um, so far, I'm and, you know we'll see how the last third does here, but yeah. So if it was a medium full in the be- in the beginning, now it's kind of medium. I don't know about that. Yeah, I'll it's say this. Not so that I, full to me. I'm I'm, a, I'm a head of rooster. Yeah, uh, maybe you are. I'm not sure, Bam, but. I agree with you about the middle of the cigar. I think it starts medium full. Then I think it's firmly medium. And I was expecting it to stay there. But honestly, this last I agree. Fourth, this last third is, is amazing. It's ramping it's like up. It's dark chocolate. And yeah. it's ramping up to some of those yeah. new world flavors and again. I'm getting, a, I'm getting pepper again. The, I'm getting some more pepper. Yeah. It's, the ac- it's an accurate statement that it's getting back into those new world profiles right now. Yeah. I yeah. feel like there's a little twang to it too. Just as yes, I agree. As yes. a little twang that, to it. I'm, I'm trying to. I'm getting that. Absolutely. Thing. Again, um, hallmark of a complex cigar. Really. Yeah, this is really interesting. Amazing. Oh, yeah. You know, and of course, it makes me say like, "Oh, I want to chase." You know, ELs. I want to you know get more of these, but no. it's just like I'm. I'm not going to do it. No, I'm not going to do it. It's very few ELs at that, that price kind of you know stand up to like an this EL. Yeah, it's like what what an EL should be. Yeah, very few. This yeah. has done it so far. The, the aroma yeah. is still amazing. It's yeah, it's so complex in the nose. The aroma, like the you like, know. just bur- just smell the burn line where we're at here at this this but point would, in the would cigar. You, would you pay? You know no. what it's going for now. No, I would. But pay- I, I wouldn't for almost any Cuban. Right. Yeah. I wouldn't spend yeah. eighty dollars on almost no. any Cuban. Right. It, it, no. <laughs> I would pay thirty five, forty bucks for this. I not even it, for a Grand Reserve. Yeah, not, I wouldn't even think a second for thirty five dollars. Agreed. Yeah, but not on Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> thirty five dollars. I would pay thirty five dollars. I would pay thirty five or forty bucks for yeah. this and smoke it twice a year. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't buy a box. Yeah, like a fiver. Oh, in the twenties, I'd buy boxes. Oh, dude, absolutely. Floral. Oh yeah, and you know, like kind of like that Ramon box that you have, the green. Really nice presentation, um, cedar box. Th- they this is very similar. It's it's bright Monte Cristo yellow. Yeah, really nice presentation. It's, it, very it's cool. not it's like cool. a dress box or or it's like a really nice presentation. It is very cool. Else, you know, yeah. but yeah, it's just expensive, and that's all it comes in. It only comes in twenty five count boxes. Yeah. Oh, it's twenty five. Yeah, it's a twenty five count box. Yeah, and that's all it comes in. What? So I, I, maybe Rooster, one of you guys knows the answer to this. I've only had a, a, I can probably count on my hands the number of ELs I've had. 
do they usually come in a 25 count? Because my Ramones come in a 10 count. Yeah, I assume usually, most... usually a 10. That's yeah, what I thought. Usually 10. It's really bizarre. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, these came in a 25. And I think the Senadoras, do those come in 25s or 10s? I don't remember what we when we talked about those. I can look right now. Um, these are certainly 25s. While you're looking for that, yeah. the... Um... Well, the Ramon is a 10 count. Yeah, I just said it's 10. Or excuse me, not the Ramon. I'm, I meant the, uh, QD. The, the, the QD, the QD, the yeah. The Hennessy we're drinking, it's, the pairing is just, it's just continuing it's, it's to be a, very good. Yeah, it's very good. It's very, so very good. And I think as it opened up, it, it, it's, yeah. as it sat in the wine glass. Agreed. You know, and by the way, I got a question for you guys. Why are we drinking this out of a wine glass? Okay, what I'm you glad make, you brought this up. So what do you drink it out of? I'm glad you brought this up. So I, I just had this revelation recently. I, I love stemware just generally. It's like ridiculous to say that. We know. But Listen, in my your house. Cat has, your cat has its own bedroom. I mean, we house. have. We have. I mean, it's, on br- cat, it's on brand. Cat, it's on brand. It's on brand. Hey, wait, wait. As, as Walter, they say, Walter tracks. has his own stemware. It tracks. It tracks. Okay? It tracks. It tracks. Yeah. It's in your brand. But in my house, you know, we have, we have champagne coupes, which is my preferred way to drink champagne over flutes. But we also have champagne flutes. We have red wine glasses, white wine glasses. I don't think you should drink them from the same type of glass. What, what the fuck is a coupe? About that coupe. A coupe. You drink out of it. It's when a you car that. Uh, it's a car. It's a, a little car. Two door. <laughs> <laughs> a coupe. What's that? It's, I've never heard of it. Jesus. It's, it's like got a stem, it. and it's like it's, it's like a ball. Open. It's like holding a ball yeah. sack. It's like what? Like in like the <laughs> <laughs> like the roaring. That's very on brand for Bam. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> If you've gotten like a nice cocktail, they'll put them in a coupe glass a lot of the time. I know okay. what you're saying. So, I, so I've had it. Yeah. yeah no okay. doubt. I mean, you've had it at my place at, at minimum, yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah. sure other places. Okay. Um, but red wine, white wine, um, uh, port glasses. I mean, I, like, I thought it was a little silly. Obviously, scotch glasses. I thought it's a little silly how much stemware exists, but I've come to appreciate that there's truly a purpose for every single glass that's made. My most recent revelation of this becoming a dad beer months ago and starting to drink beer yeah. regularly for the first time in since my college days. Mm. And I, I just remember, I was like, you know, I'm drinking enough beer at this point. I should probably get beer glasses. Yeah. I got to say Creighton Barrel has these beautiful, love, beautiful. Love Creighton Barrel. Oh Creighton my Barrel's God. Awesome. It's, it's awesome. impossible not to spend money in that They place. have what? These beautiful like Pilsner glasses. Nice. Like, exquisite mm. yeah and i bought these and i just i pour in it a yingling a very simple but great beer awesome beer not an expensive beer in this glass and it looks like a million dollars wow yeah it just totally transformed the experience and then recently through this you know through our podcast as we're sampling a lot more cognac um starting to develop so much of an appreciation for cognac that now i'm reaching for like remy regularly yeah and we're drinking just for the listener we're drinking as a group we're drinking a lot of 1738 it's so Dude, good it is it is like nectar for, oh my God. for 60 bucks fantastic i can't i can't get enough of that bottle <sighs> amazing and so i was drinking enough of it i said all right i need to now have snifters Snifter. a cognac glass mm, yeah. mm. and one of the things i will say that's really disappointing and i think it's because cognac doesn't have the same market that whiskeys do or plenty of other spirits um, it's really hard to find good cognac glasses, good snifters. I went through hell and high water to find stuff. Can you use a brandy snifter? Glass? Yeah, but but same different, same thing. Yeah, and even though I'm it's telling got a big you, big bowl, big and, bowl, it's yeah. got a short little stem, so, and a beautiful big bowl, yeah. so that you can just put your nose in there like a wine glass and just get the incredible rich aroma that comes from such a like concentrated, flavorful spirit like cognac especially heavily aged cognac. And I tried everything. I mean, I'm like Crate and Barrel. That's my favorite store to buy stuff from. Their snifters are a complete joke. Yeah. They're mm-hmm. tiny little skinny glasses. They're supposed to have like a wide bowl right. so you can really get the nose. The only place I was able to find nice ones, it was uh, Bloomingdale's actually had. Um, and so I have those now. But at our lounge here, to its credit, it's got tons of stemware, martini glasses, wine glasses. Yeah. You know, highball, scotch, yep. everything you could possibly want. And the only thing they don't have, understandably, is a cognac snifter. And when we were going to have this XO, I'm sitting there saying to myself, we have to drink this out of a, a, a somewhat proper glass. 
And a scotch glass, I don't think, does this justice. Is it because of the nose? Is it because of how That's, it opens up? What I think is there's, it? there's a lot of reasons why. It, so going back to the, the initial analogy, my I worked as a uh, in the food service industry for a while, uh, and I was a bar back, and then I was a, a bus boy, and then I was a waiter, and I was actually bartending a little bit. But I did it at a at a place called it was a bear area, and they they sold a mass amount of beers, mm. and that's what they were known for. Like they had so many different kinds of beers, and accordingly, they had hundreds of different kinds of stemware. Well, not hundreds. That's crazy. <laughs> a, a large amount of stemware. For me, I'm like, just give me a beer glass. Just give me a standard pint glass, right? No. If you're getting a Duvel, you need to put it in this big snifter. If you're getting a Stout, you need to put it in this kind of snifter. If you're getting a Pilsner, here's this oddly shaped one for, for only Czech beers that that has an, a weird kind of bulge in the middle, but then really narrow on the end. And you have to use that one. And if you have an American lager, this, this is, is crazy. No, yeah. I'm dead serious. It makes sense, though. No, I, I mean, I, I would have never thought. Yeah, and you know what? It really does elevate the flavor mm. in a way that because there's different flavor profiles that come through the effervescence of the carbonation at at different points in the glass, and because of that, uh. when you sip it there's certain parts of the beer that are tempered and it's like a, you're going to get, you know how a chef does a, does a different courses and he, he takes you on a journey. Yeah. The stemware can do that for you wow. with the different grinder is spot on here. Excellent. And this is why when I mentioned champagne glasses earlier, I mean, you'll remember I, I serve champagne in, in coops yep. and it was poop. I remember he just, he takes a sip and he goes, where did you get these glasses? Like immediately mm -hmm. he's like, I want to drink champagne oh, only out of coops after yeah. being yeah. at my yeah. place. Yeah. And the thing is, the problem, I don't know who invented the champagne flute. It's just so stupid. You don't get the nose no, of the at champagne it's at too all. too narrow. Too narrow. Way yeah, too, too narrow. Yeah. It just completely restricts its ability to open up. So you get that effervescence that Grinder's talking about in a coupe glass with the, the wide nature of it. You get that. Actually, I think I, I, think I, I certainly remember at your house now. You don't and I also much. that's the, that's the, <laughs> yeah. that's that was a rough night by the way <laughs> from that night oh yeah that I was the I, famous for the listener that was the famous sink night yes but, that was yeah. the sink night <laughs> that, we'll let I, that go that's similar to the kind of glasses they give you on airlines no 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 am I wrong I mean I want to fly that airline if they <laughs> are but I haven't seen that no. it's not, not on American United United, <laughs> United <laughs> baby <laughs> yeah United has <laughs> I would pay. To see a coupe glass out of United flight. Yeah, the they wouldn't even know what a coupe glass is. So here's, so I'm taking two things out of this. So number one, the glass is changing how the, the alcohol is able to open up or breathe. Bingo. And then the second component is your nose's ability to participate mm -hmm. in the sipping of the alcohol. Do I have that correct? That's exactly yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. So it's two different things and that are happening in each of these and even with this, with this wine glass that may not be appropriate for this particular but spirit. it's as close it's, to it. Yeah, as you're yeah. able to get a beautiful nose on that as you're taking a sip. It's, it's pretty outstanding. Yeah. Which you wouldn't get, in, you're saying, in a, in a whiskey glass. Yeah. You, yeah, yeah, it's even just the rounded nature of the glass. Mm -hmm. Like when you swirl the spirit, yeah. if this were not round and this were like a, a cylinder, like a, a, a rock, you know, scotch glass that you're going to have, it just doesn't allow it to swirl yeah. up the sides in the same way that just gets close to your nose and you're able to just have the same sensory experience as yeah. a glass like this. I, it's also, it, it, it it's very particular, right? And similar to wine, similar to, to beer, there's different elements of how they're brewed or how they're uh, aged or, you know, uh, distilled or whatever that come to life when they're in a different vessel and we in my business we always say delivery is is the key because you can have you can have a great piece of work and you can do a great job and if it's not delivered in the right way it could fall flat yeah That's right and uh the stem you know i don't think it's i don't think it's uh it's bizarre to, to have a fascination with with stemware because it's it truly does elevate. Yeah, you know so the right stemware really does does play. Lounge key. lizard stemware <laughs> <laughs> is it in the works? I'll say this: whether or not we put stemware up on the the lizard merch store, I just 
strongly recommend and challenge any listener, whatever your favorite drink is, if it's beer, if it's scotch, if it's cognac, you name it, buy a glass designed for that drink. And I, please write us, I would be mm-hmm. stunned if you do not experience, if you do not enhance your experience drinking that. Elevate. Elevate. Senator. Just based on the stemware that you're enjoying it in. Hmm. I, I uh, a thousand percent agree. Hmm. I learned something tonight. Me too. Yeah. Wow. Stemware. And I, also just when you're having a simple night at home, it's like, you know how many times I crack open a bottle of beer and I say like, oh, I'll just drink it out of the bottle. And then I say, no, no, wait a minute. I go get one of those beautiful Pilsner glasses and I pour it in and it's like I'm just transported to like a nice restaurant or something. Like it just yeah. you know, yeah. changes everything. Honestly, a trip and to it, Crate and Barrels, I think, in order. <laughs> oh, yeah. That makes a yeah. lot can of you sense. Get, can uh, you get me some stemware? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> William Sonoma also is a great source. Yes, yes. I'm in the market true. for overpriced sofas and, and uh, sectionals now, so I can't <laughs> wait to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for... for, for you so in, you in, red, in red wine, like you were talking about red and white, you know, for glasses. But in red wine, they, you can go even deeper into like Beaujolais and Cabernets. You can. Right? Now, I'll just be honest. As <laughs> much as I'm militant about tradition and all this stuff, I think it's a little overkill to be completely honest within red wine. I mean, they've got a red wine glass for everything. A cab glass, a burgundy glass, a pinot glass. I mean, a burgundy and a pinot are the same fucking thing, but yet <laughs> French burgundy should be drank out of one glass and American or some other country's pinot should be out of another. It's the you, same grape. You know, I mean, it's yeah. crazy. So, Senator, I have a fr- I have an Italian friend um and he's he's from he's he's Italian, he's from Italy and he um he came over and the, the one of the the things that I said, what was like what was shocking for you when you came over to America? He said, "Well, the thing that was shocking for me is that in Italy we drink wine with a, a lot of our meals, right? We always have wine to have to have with our meals. And that wine is table wine." It's nothing special. It's just what we we always drink it. It's just table wine. And we put it in this little simple glass. It's not a it does, it's not a stemware. Usually flat bottom. Flat bottom yeah. glass. Yeah, yeah. It looks like, you know, it's just a very simple small it's a glass. Drinking glass. And he said, You guys get you guys get so sophisticated with your wine. And he said, We just we just drink what we have. And it's and it's simple and it's not we don't we don't pair. It's just always the same wine. And it's and it's and it's it's about yeah. the um my point is that there's a the enjoyment of that kind of spirit is so ubiquitous that you can't you can't delimit you can't delimit the amount of enjoyment people have just by changing the stemware. They're always going to love that spirit. Oh, and totally. I mean, I'd it. still enjoy this cognac if it were in anything, but yeah. it definitely adds that extra touch for sure. Yeah. That yeah. just it caps an amazing experience. Yeah. Well, I think it makes it special. Yeah, it does. The Italians yeah. have a lot to learn from us. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> how to drink wine? <laughs> yeah, we can teach them a lot. <laughs> Use proper stemware. <laughs> <laughs> Mandavi. He could teach. He'll be. He'll, he'll do, he'll do a, a TED talk. <laughs> well, I'm I'm very happy with this pairing, and, and I'm you know a lot of the time when we when we record. I feel like I have a sense of where the ratings are going to end up. I really, tonight, I have no idea where both of these are going to line up. I'm oh, I really, know. really I curious. Idea. I kind of have an idea. I'm really curious yeah. where these are going to line up. I, I don't have a sense. It's going to line up where all the other, the average. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I'm, I'm very curious to see how this goes. I can tell you in this room what everybody's going to rate. I, I think we should do. <laughs> are we going to uh, taint ratings now? Is that right? No. All right. So we're coming into the end of this thing, boys. Any uh, final comments before we uh, start to do our ratings? I think I agree with the uh, consens- consensus in the room about the way the cigar started and the way it ended is very similar. Mm. The middle, to me, was a little, you know, it fizzled off a bit. Do, do you- but it did pick up a strength, not quite up to the same level as the very beginning. Yeah. But it did pick up. Do you Do you guys feel that, this is, um, you know, we've talked about how the last third of the cigar is often, especially in New Worlds. I mean, obviously we're smoking a Cuban, but in New Worlds, often the last third of the cigar is the weakest. Yeah. This, to me, as to 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 Rooster's point, has made a turnaround back to really being enjoyable in the last third. Um, it has. You know, I feel like Cubans are unique in that way, where a, a lot of the time the last third of the Cuban is 
is does deliver. Oh, it does. Where a lot of the times the, the new world hundred percent agree. You know. I'm curious what makes that happen. I guess it's just a blend thing or the tobacco or how know, it reacts when it heats up. But we talk about, you know, how many acts a cigar has, and this is I think definitely a three act. Absolutely. Player. Absolutely. So you guys ready to uh do the formal liquor rating mm-hmm. on the Hennessy XO? All right. I can guess where that this is going to go. So I'm I'm actually curious. <laughs> is this like a rating for cognacs or a rating for everything? Like it's for rating for, of your experience tonight oh, of you this got specific right. cognac. This, I'm aligned. All right, yeah. Bam All right. Bam, you're up. I'm going with a nine. Nine. Grinder. Nine. Senator. So I'm between in a nine and a ten. I was actually can between a nine and ten. Too. I'm there yeah, too. I thought you guys would be at a ten. I, I, but yeah. here's the thing. So I mean, this is the beauty of this podcast. We have reviewed another XO, and it was the Remy Martin XO. And I can't help but compare. I mean, it's yep. class. It's competitive set is our XO cognacs. I have to give that Remy XO the edge over this. Agreed, one hundred percent, thousand percent. This is outstanding. Agree. There's no doubt about it. This is a top notch premium cognac. But I would definitely reach for the Remy XO over this, and so that I gave a ten. This I'm going to have to give a nine. Yeah, I he said exactly what I was going to say. It's very fair. It's very very close, but the Remy just gives me a little bit more enjoyment or pleasure than than this Hennessy does. Yeah. Go ahead. What's the cost difference between the two? I don't remember. I think they're pretty. Oh, close. They're all around the same. Uh, Every XO is between two hundred and two hundred fifty bucks. Did we pay yeah. that for the Remy? Really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Remy, I think was two twenty five. Okay. Yeah. So I'm also going to give it a nine, which obviously makes our composite lizard score a nine point zero. Excellent. Which I think is very appropriate. Now, Agreed. the one thing I want to say, when we look at our uh, for you know our, our lizard ratings here, the Remy Martin seventeen thirty eight. Scored a nine point three, and I, I can for my for me it's the smoothness, um, and really a little sweeter than this particular spirit for me. Yeah, so the 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 seventeen thirty eight edging this out yeah. is not a surprise to me. No, it's deserved. Agreed. I mean that's why I I just can't emphasize enough what Remy did in coming out with the seventeen thirty eight is pure brilliance, and the simple reason is. When you look at the delta between different levels of any spirit, like let's start with tequila, right? We did a whole special on tequila with with uh, Ricky on this. You look at what a Reposado costs, let's say 50 a bottle, and you look at what an Anejo costs, 60, maybe 70, mm-hmm. maybe 80. There's not a massive delta between those. The problem with cognac, it's like a blessing and a curse the delta between a VSOP, which on average is 50 bucks a bottle, and an XO that's 200 to 250 a bottle, that's a huge delta. That's massive. I mean, every day to drink, we're not going to spend 200 and some dollars on a bottle. We're just going to consume you know, left and right. Right. And so what Remy realized is if we make something in between that actually takes VSOP and XO age spirit and blend those, and created at a, a more accessible price point. Yeah. I mean, it's 60, 60 bucks, bucks a bottle. So mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a little more than a third of this. And so. honestly, I get almost as much enjoyment out of that as I do this. And yes. that price point, to me, definitely puts it ahead of right. So what's the comparison between a Remy XO and a Remy 17, uh, 17 what? 38. 38. 38. So, I mean, I said this on that episode, but... The, ec- the Remy XO is outstanding. It's it's probably the best cognac I've ever we, had. That's the only 10.0 that we've ever had on it the It was incredible. There you go. I mean, it was, it was that good. Uh, it was flawless. There's not one singular complaint about that. But the problem becomes when you have the 1738 and you're sitting there saying to yourself, this is almost as complex as that was, almost as smooth as that was. At and $60. It's $60 it's, yeah. instead yeah. of 225 yeah. bucks. And yeah. it's... It's you know, just a no-brainer. And what's nuts about that particular spirit, it's so delicious, you can polish up a bottle in a sitting. <laughs> you really almost can Don't drive it. home, boys. No. <laughs> Easily. Look in my recycling. Come on. Yeah. Come oh, on. you're right. Come on. Dude, I, I said that earlier. I mean, I bought a bottle of that, and I finished it in the weekend. Just the versatility of that, three, of that four bottle cigars. at that price is incredible. And that's, and what, that's what gives it the higher rating. You know what's interesting, too? And we didn't talk about this with Cognac, but and I know we have to do the, the, the rating on the cigar, but I find that kind of like tequila... 
the cognac that I'm drinking, the 1738 or any time that we've had cognac, when I wake up the next morning, I feel totally fine. Same. Are you energized like your tequila? Well, the tequila, the that's infusion. like I feel like the Energizer Bunny. But <laughs> but I feel great. There's no hangover. Like I feel like with a lot of single malts or yeah. beer. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. or this even is, wine. This is what happens when you start drinking a lot. You don't, <laughs> you don't get hangovers. <laughs> you become immune. <laughs> you feel fine. So, so, yeah, I was, I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> but, you know, Rooster just kind of dinged it very Sorry. well. Yeah, no, it's all good. I'm with you there, and I think with cognac, um, there are far, far fewer cognacs that use additives and things that will give you that hangover. And so if you buy a reputable cognac, um, odds are you're going to feel great as long as you obviously you're not down in the bottle in one sitting. Mm -hmm. You're going to feel very good because it's, they, it's natural stuff. They don't need to because when you're aging something that long, additives – deteriorate and make it taste terrible you can't you can't do that you ha it has to be something that's organic and it's working brilliantly yeah. whatever they're doing because it's really something that i wish that i ex you know kind of like tequila good tequila i wish that i had learned of cognac earlier in my journey mm -hmm. me too yeah. and the last thing i want to say that we have mentioned about cognac i think for the most part in this room this is true for i, I think every lizard most of the time when we're drinking scotch, which we love as like the go-to pairing with a cigar, most of the time we're putting a chip or two or even a few cubes of ice with that. Mm -hmm. Cognac, when you have good cognac, I mean, we are all sitting here. Not one of us has a single chip of ice in this. Nope. When you even pour the 1738, do I sometimes like maybe just a chip or two? Sure. I do, I do it just for temperature. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. But does it need it? No. No. It and does not. That's something that's very unique to cognac. How smooth yet rich and flavorful these spirits are. Yeah. It's one of the few, it's probably the only spirit that I regularly drink neat. It, a lot, yeah. it allows for a full experience without the chip. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Now, what a revelation, boys. Konya continues to deliver. Yeah, and as we, get, as we get to rating this guy. Yeah, as Senator was talking, I'm relighting my nub of yeah. this cigar because I've really enjoyed it all the way down. Yeah. Great cigar. Really, but, really good. But, yeah. you know, price is going to have to be a exactly. factor here. That, yeah, I mean, I was just going to go there. Sorry, but. Of course. Yeah. Of course. All right, boys, you ready to do the uh, formal lizard rating on this thing? I'm a little nervous to rate this. Cigar. <laughs> all right, well. <laughs> Rooster, you're up. Yeah, so, um, you know, keeping in mind, like, the price, like, the introduction price was, like, $22 a stick. I think at that price, this is easily at 9 Yeah, no doubt. But at the current price, I'm going to have to give it an 8 Okay. So I'm going to give this a 9 I, I really enjoyed the cigar. Um, you know, the price absolutely is, is, is a problem. You know, the, the current 2023 price is a problem. But it, it, I really enjoyed this experience tonight, and I've really, really been enjoying Monte Cristo. Um, so it's a nine for me for sure. Yeah, I just want to add something to that. The way the flavor was in the beginning, had it kind of continued a little bit more, oh, it would have been an, it would have uh, absolutely you know improved the my score a little for you, bit. Yeah. yeah, 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 Senator. Um, for me, this is easier than I thought it would be. I'm right there with Gizmo at a nine. And I guess the only thing that makes this, that made this slightly difficult for me was the price. But the way I, I feel like the way I factor in price with Cuban cigars is, is different than New Worlds in the sense that everything, all Cuban cigar, the prices are all going up and just getting ridiculous. So, you know, it's like if, if I'm going to sit here and rate a Sir Winston, am I going to say, well, because I have to spend like $80 to get a Sir Winston that all of a sudden, like I'm, I'm kind of looking at all of them at what I used to be able to get them for not too long ago. We're talking just like within the last couple of years. And I think at 20 something dollars, this is an absolute steal. I think when Gizmo said he'd pay $35, $40 for this, double that, yeah. I would too. Yep. It's that good. Mm. Um, I'll also say that for me, oh, you wouldn't play, you wouldn't pay quad, uh, quadruple for that. Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'll be happy to take one if someone wants to give me one. <laughs> um, but the, the other thing about this stick, you know, rooster was talking about how the flavors sort of changed throughout it. 
I I have a slightly different take in the sense that the first third of this was so New World esque. I was worried it almost was going to lose its Cuban character or DNA. And so I was kind of glad that when I got into the second third, while it certainly decreased in intensity of flavor and it was firmly medium at that point, I was sitting there saying like, this is, this is a Cuban cigar. Now, now exactly what I would expect is happening in this stick. And then the last third I thought did the best job of kind of balancing between Cuban and new world. So I like the progression. Actually, I, I like that it never got too full or too strong. So for me, it was actually a virtue that, that this cigar kind of changed the way it did as I went along and I'm firmly at a nine. Yeah. Grinder. I'm at a 10. Wow. Oh, my wow. man. Um, wow. For me, I'm, see that that's what I was saying earlier. I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is what I was talking about. I had no idea where these ratings yeah. were going to go. Yeah, to. You're absolutely right. hundred yeah. percent surprised. Yeah. So for, for me, the experience was wonderful. Mm. Um, I think the pairing, you know, the the pairing was was really special, um, and you know I, I've talked about you know my flavor profile before. Um, this was such an adventure because of the you know the changes that that you guys mentioned was evident for me, um, and I think we had. Obviously, a wonderful experience drinking this with the with the with the uh, Hennessy, but the conversation was wonderful, and ultimately, the amount of complexity that I see in this cigar is so compelling, and I I love it. It's it's so like I'm curious what they did here. I'm just like, how yeah. did they get some of these flavors to change and metamorphosize so quickly? And then come back and be like, oh, I was just kidding. Oh, wait, here we go again. <laughs> and it was just, it was such a roller coaster. And it it began wonderfully. It ended wonderfully. Mm -hmm. And and the middle was just as sweet. So what can you, what more can you ask for in a cigar? You can't. It's true. Like literally, what more can you ask for? For yeah. me, that's like the epitome of success. That's Agreed. awesome. Agreed. So it's a 10. Excellent. I don't give 10s. I don't you, know. I, I was going to say, I don't, I think that may be the second or third time. <laughs> You've ever given a ten, and I don't remember him ever giving a ten. Yeah, no, he's given a few. Oh, is that I right? feel like he has. I've given okay. a couple. Yeah, yeah a couple. I, I was looking over the tables recently. <laughs> you're, you're a tough judge, yeah. uh, but <laughs> but um, it, it was this. This was a special cigar, and and so thankful to the listener um, who sent this in, and uh, what an experience! Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Yes, bam bam. Yeah, absolute shout out to the listener that sent these in. Mile high cigar guy. Yeah. Um, you know, Man. I, I, for me, the, you mentioned the Cuban DNA earlier. I did get that right off the bat because there aren't many new worlds for me personally that I'll get that potpourri and dried fruit and a little hint of that barnyard. For me, that's, that's for me, Cuban DNA all the way. Um, but the journey as it went through all three of its stages, really complex. I don't know what my rating is. Okay. I don't know. Well, we need it right now. I, I know you do. <laughs> You know, an eight, I think, is a little painful for me to give it an eight. And a 10, I'd give this a 10 all day long if I can get it at an affordable price. I guess I have to settle at a nine, and I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with a nine. I want to give it a 10. So give it a 10. It's just too expensive. But 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 not at this the price that it's we... Too, yeah. It's too expensive. You didn't pay for it. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> the, <laughs> at the at the price point that our listener uh, was afforded this opportunity, I think it's it's very reasonable. And a uh, hundred dollars? No, no. I mean, it, it, seventy two. It, it launched. It was twenty seven. Yeah, twenty bucks. I don't know what he time. paid for. Yeah, it, but, yeah, you know. yeah. All right. Oh, sorry, so, what's I'm your number? I'm giving. What's your it, number? I, I, like I said, it's a painful nine. Okay. All right, boys. It, it, it was painful. <laughs> to get that out of you <laughs> okay <laughs> so the formal lizard rating on the monte cristo supremo cl from 2019 boys is a 9.0 wow wow I, it's excellent yeah, cigar. yeah. I, I don't understand that how that math works out but <laughs> how is it i gave it a 10 you guys all gave it a nine. 10 nine. i gave oh nine. you gave it eight. Eight. who gave it a eight he gave it eight. an eight. Oh, sorry yeah don't apologize ever <laughs> rooster <laughs> Don't apologize if you're not actually sorry. So let's briefly talk about um, other Monte Cristos that we've done on the pod, because uh, I think that's an interesting thing. So this yeah. just edged out by a tenth, uh, edged out the 1935 linea we did. It edged on, it above? Yeah. It, uh, that, that came out at an 8.9 there there on was, episode there, four. There, there, were, there were more lizards there, though. 
I love that cigar. I, that's true. I also just want to say I'm only speaking for my palate. I think that's perfect. Yeah. I would give this a slight edge yeah, over that. I, cigar. Think, I think you're right, mm. Senator. So the Monte Cristo number two, which we talked about quite a bit, came out at an 8.4. I think that's perfectly appropriate. Um, so, you know, and a Monte Cristo number one, as we talked about, I don't even need to mention it, but that came out at a 6.3. So this is definitely the highest rated Monte Cristo from Cuba that we've had on the pod. Plus, that, that one, I think, was more a performance issue than flavor profile, if no, I remember correctly. No. The, the, the Maltus? The one? No. Oh, the Monte were, one was a... Yeah, yeah that that's was, performance, that did, yeah, not that flavor, perform. because if you do get a good Monte no, no, one... it's both. It's well, both. I don't I'm know. Sorry, the flavor. We we've all said that that's at best yeah. an afternoon smoke. It's not a super yeah, flavorful right. cigar. And I think everybody's palate is a little bit different. This is true. So you know, if if I like like a full flavored smoke, so I I mean like the beginning of the cigar was awesome. It was. So I wish the middle was a little bit shortened, like I had more a lot more flavor, like the beginning, mm-hmm. and it would easily be like a nine plus, you know, for me. So. And I, again, we we mentioned it a few times. I have to say, I mean, we're almost, but we're over an hour and a half in. We just all have just uh, Bam Bam still finishing his. We're ju- we're just finishing our cigars. I smoked mine in my fingernails, but I couldn't yeah, take but, it. Yeah, but I yeah. mean, it, it's a five and an eighth inch cigar. Yeah, I'm. I, I can't remember the last time I smoked a five inch cigar for an hour and a half. Yeah, but it's a fifty five ring. Uh, yeah. I understand, but yeah, even an E two, yeah. I do an E two in an hour I, fifteen, I agree. Mm-hmm. which is a longer yeah. cigar. That burns quicker. This one yeah. has a lot more tobacco. A lot of it's tobacco in it. It, it yeah. definitely it's burns oily. slow. It's, it's not burning. It's which, more oily. Which goes to, I mean, obviously the current price point is absurd. The value. But at, like there yeah. is a value at 20 something, 30 something, oh, even yeah, 40 indeed. bucks. Like it, it's packed. Yeah. Good point. It Very burns good point. slowly. It's so flavorful. There's a lot of merit. The, you you yes. can tell there's a unique aging that goes on here because of the, the amount of oil in that in that leaf and it's still it's still oily even at when it's at my fingertips you know it's yeah. i still it's still coating my my palate and it's 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 really special i mean that's why the cuban tobacco with some age and you know i'm not talking about els or even regionals just regular production cubans with a little bit of age not like a huge amount of age like four years five years six years it I mean, it does something to that tobacco. To there, that yeah. There's a difference, though, between aging in pilones when they're in like the factory and aging in a humidor, right? Right. I wonder what the difference is. Like, how, like, what, what is changing in the chemical composition of the leaf when it's in, you know, pilones and they're cha- they're they're managing the temperature and there's some kind of like chemical combustion that's happening versus when it's rolled. And it's sitting in a temperature-controlled humidor. There's got to be something different, though, with yeah. that aging process. Because they're not doing that for a long time with Cuban seed tobacco. They're doing it for a long time with New Age in Nicaragua and others. Maybe because they have to. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but the, I'm not sure. Yeah. I got to say, I'm happy to see that Senator is still smoking that bad boy down. Yeah, he's at the to nub. The nub. To the nub. He's at the nub again. I mean, it's an excellent it's, smoke. It's yeah. excellent. excellent. I'm really shocked. Yep. All right, so first we have to say thank you again mm. to Mile High Cigar Guy thank for sending so us much. these cigars. Thank you so this, much. What an uh, amazing experience. And as Grinder mentioned, how cool is it that we have these amazing lizards out there, these listeners, these friends um, who are so generous to send us these cigars. I mean, it's it's brilliant. And, and, to, we're and so to, all, thankful. to all listeners, we want to continue to engage. That's, this is what we're here for, to, to build community and to talk about cigars amongst ourselves. And we want you to be in the room with us, as as Gizmo says all the time, the 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 eighth lizard, right? Yep, absolutely. Um, so uh, happy to have you here with us tonight. Yeah, it's very, awesome. Very well said. Yeah, thank you. Well, boys, a nine point zero for both the Hennessy XO and the Monte Cristo Supremos EL from twenty nineteen. A phenomenal pairing tonight. Can you say we'll see you next week in Denver? Can we go visit? <laughs> I know why you want to go to Denver. <laughs> what a great I why, city. I know why you want to go to Denver. Uh, Senator, can I go with you, please? <laughs> What's it, the Brown Palace? And then other, other assorted establishments. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pay for the airfare. <laughs> awesome night, guys. Uh, fantastic. Um, a plus. W- what a pairing. 9.0 for both. And uh, awesome. We'll see you guys next week. Very good. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks for joining us. You can find our merch store and ratings archive at our brand new website, loungelizardspod.com. That's loungelizardspod.com. 
Don't forget to leave us a rating and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. If you have any comments, questions, if you want to reach out, say hello, tell us what you're smoking, email us, hello at loungelizardspod.com. You can also find us on Instagram at loungelizardspod. We really appreciate your time and we'll, uh, we'll see you next week. Hope-